Hey, did you know black and brown people across the world are reconnecting to their roots and redefining their relationships to the land by gardening and farming? And Black Gardener Talk is dedicated to sharing those voices to inspire all people of color and maybe even some that don't look like us to grow by any means necessary. But sometimes we just need our own safe space to talk. Good morning, I'm Kamani Anku, and this is Black Gardener Talk, and my guest today is Chris Riddick of Afrobeats. Um, let's get it, let's get it popping, y'all. What's up, everybody? Wake up. It's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. Let me, um, get Chris Riddick, um, in the room. I saw that he started alive, but I don't know what's that all about. Let me get him. He's supposed to be coming over to me. Afro, Afro. Good morning, y'all. I know it's early. Early. In the morning. Can y'all hear me? I'm trying to get Chris in the room. Chris, where are you? Chris, where are you? One, two, one, two, one, two. I'm trying to get Chris. Let me see if I can. He started his own live. I don't know why he started his own live, but I'm trying to get him in the room. Let's see what's up. Try to get him in the room. He started his own life. I don't know why. Chris, you unable to join me. Send me a request. I hate when this happens. The background, you like the background? That's what's up. Hey, what's up, y'all? Chris, can you send me a request? He said you was unable to join. We're going to get it together, folks. Hold on one second. While he comes in the room, hopefully he can come in the room. Were y'all able to hear the music at the beginning? Let me know if y'all was able to hear the music at the beginning. The background, everybody likes the background. Yeah, this is for Black Garden to talk to Red. Um, hopefully uh, at the green soon. Um, Chris, I'm waiting for you. Can you, Christian? I'm sorry, Christian Reddick. Send me an invite. What is going on? Christian. Oh, play the some music while play the music while you wait. Um I'll see. I don't wanna get cut off. Um but yeah, it's season two of Black Gardener Talk. Um we got some phenomenal people coming through. Um Garden Under the Influences coming through. Andre the farmer coming through. Um let's see if I can get him now. Um Got a lot of people coming through. Um, I don't know what's going on. Chris, I keep sending it to you. Christian, I mean. You may have to update your, um, what's new? Hey, there we are. Oh, there we go. I'm going to figure it out. 
<laughs> Finally. Yeah, and my microphone. Yeah, no problem. Let me I try know, this technology. again real quick. Um, I can hear you. Can you hear? Okay, yeah, the microphone keeps going out. I don't know what's going on. I bought this iRig, and the iRig is technology, not working. Technology, man. What you do? Work. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing this morning? I know, right? So this, everyone, I'm good. Everyone, this is Chris Reddick um, from Afro Beats. Um, and I thought it was a great name because I'm gardening beats. And when I saw it one day online, I was like, me and this guy need to connect. And so we finally connected and last year around this time. He actually brought me on his podcast and it led to a lot of different things. Um, speaking at Montgomery College twice, um, a clubhouse, LinkedIn, doing a couple lives with different people like that. Um, I got some clients, a young lady named Tia. He introduced me to a lady named Tia, and um, we got a garden going for Tia and her family. Um, so it's been great. So now that I have a platform, I was like, I'm going to have him on the show. Absolutely. You know what I'm Greg, so, glad to be are. here, man. And I, your success is all your own. You really shine in that, that podcast, and I'm sure you helped a lot of people. So I appreciate you coming on. Oh, most definitely. Um, so let's get right into it. Like, Oof. what got you into gardening? It's a, it's a very unorthodox situation. So the way I got into gardening is I through service, really. So I was in this program called City Year um, back in the day. If anybody knows them, they're an AmeriCorps program. Yeah, red coats. I, City Year. I was I was the legit City Year. We were in, up in uh, Boston. This is me after school, coming out of four years of college in Western Massachusetts. And uh, I was just trying to figure out my next move in life, you know, just trying to go through and say, OK, how can I help? What could I do to, to contribute? The thing, the catalyst that really got me into city year um, was the, the shooting of unarmed black men, really. Um, you know, specifically, there was a shooting in Baltimore that like really touched me and was like, all right, I got to do something because the way I'm living life right now is in contributing to the greater good for our people. And so I wanted to contribute something and do anything. So I got into City Year with that mindset in mind. Fast forward later, while I'm in my second year of this basically service program, I do this MLK service day. And in this service day, we went to a community center in a way, uh, specifically for senior citizens, where we go and create these food kits for them. So we would create these uh, soup kits that were based off of their culture. So like it would have like cassava and it. it would have potatoes, have onions and a bunch of different foods in it. And uh, it was beautiful. But the person who was hosting this event was called uh, Josh, who I consider a mentor. And he has this business called Fresh Truck. And the, the concept of Fresh Truck is that they convert old school buses into produce markets. So it's basically a, a market on wheels. So you can go inside the school bus and on both sides of the school bus, all the chairs are emptied out. It's completely hollow. And then they have just shelves and shelves of like different produce and vegetables and things like that. And so, yeah, they're, they're doing amazing right now as far as I can tell. And uh, they even partner with like hospitals and things like that. They go through communities, food apartheids, food deserts, and make sure people have the foods they need. And so for me, that was like the starting point. I was like, oh, wow. Like I started learning about food apartheid. I started learning about growing your own food. I went into like this wormhole of like trying to figure out who looks like me that's actually growing food. Because I was like, all right, maybe that's where I can start. You know, I, I might not have all the knowledge, but I could start at home just like seeing what I can grow. And uh, so I did. I went down this rabbit hole. I ran into Ron Finley like on YouTube and he was like, you know, growing your own food is like printing your own money. And I was like, okay, that's appealing to me. I like money. I like food. So <laughs> I, uh, I picked it up and I was like, I, I mean, the first time I gardened was absolutely atrocious. Like I killed every herb I ever tried to put in the window. I think the only thing I could grow at the time was oh, this no. radish, probably the size of my thumb. And I was so happy with that one radish. In hindsight, it wasn't good at all. But like, I was so, if you look back at the OG, like, Afrobeats Instagram, you'll see this picture of this just like hey, this dangling little radish. And I'm like so proud of that radish. Um, but that was the start. I was hooked from there. Um, I eventually started being able to grow some things more and more. And 
I realized, oh, like if I'm going to grow all this food, I don't want to put it to waste. I'm going to need to learn how to cook too. And so Afrobeats was just really birthed out of me trying to document my journey and my process and learn more about connecting to the land and growing your own food. That's what's up. I mean, we have similarities. I mean, I mean, you got to grow the food, right? And then exactly. when you grow the food, what do you do with the food? You know what I'm saying? Especially if you never grew any food, what do you do? How do you um, cook it? So, I mean, that's what my platform is about, too, is not only just growing your food, but how do you, you um, cook it and prepare it? And also, you know, we want to be healthy with it. But um, where was your first garden? And what did you grow? Uh, you said the radish. First grow. things I tried to grow, grow uh, radish. I would say uh, different herbs. I tried to grow lavender in like the middle of winter in Boston <laughs> did not work out. Uh, but I, I would say my, my first legit garden where I started getting actual production was when I came back home to DC. Um, so I didn't have, I had actually less space. I've probably moved four or five times uh, since I've been back home in the DC area. And I've tried to build a garden anywhere I went everywhere. I went. I've been in apartments. I've been in like row houses. I've been in all kinds of things. But the last, the first thing I um, started growing was in my window. I literally built this, these towers. Yeah, tell yeah. the people about it because that was interesting, y'all. This guy, like, he had put a garden box yeah. thing outside his window. Like, I've, I've had crazy. the craziest about contraptions it. of like DIY projects just to figure out any way I can grow food. The first project was I created these towers of just like platforms. They were literally like basically shelves where you could just put plants on so I could use the maximum um, amount of space in my window. And so in there I was growing like uh, a basil plant. I actually wasn't managed to grow tomatoes in it. And I didn't know about, you know, how much space tomatoes needed at the time, but I actually grew tomatoes in probably like an eight inch pot at the time. And I didn't even think you could grow something because usually in tomatoes, you want at least like, you know, five gallons. You want them to spread. You want to get a good production. I learned about like yield and production later on. Uh, but I was growing tomatoes. I grew like Chinese eggplants in my window. Um, I just put it in a southwest facing window and things just happened for me. And uh, what else did I do? I, I did collards. Absolutely. So I stuck with some of the basics. Later on, I transitioned to more like African diaspora specific crops. Um, but yes, I also grew uh, a couple of years ago. I learned about self-watering containers and how beneficial those could be, especially for new gardeners, because the concept of self-watering container is you don't have to water, you know, every day like you might do a traditional garden. You know, you have this reservoir of water that you build inside a container that you fill that up about once a week and you let the plant water itself. And so one strategy I used to grow is I used to grow in uh, storage bins. So the storage bins you used to pack your you know, clothes away, your old junk away, I converted those storage bins into a garden basically. And so I created this reservoir system that you can put at the bottom of those bins and then the plants just kind of feed itself. And in that I was growing you know, radishes, carrots, greens, different things like that. So I. Did you put no. holes in those um, <clears throat> so, bins? Despite what you think, a lot of people think you always need holes in your containers. You don't always need holes. It's definitely for newer gardeners, I suggest like you need to know where the water is coming from. You basically need like the reason why you you know you need holes in the garden in the first place is because you don't want your your root system to get suffocated, right? And you want your your plants to be able to breathe properly. But if you have a space where <clears throat> there's a pocket of air within like a container and that your plants can breathe from, and they're not just constantly just being drenched in water, then you can actually do it without uh, drainage holes. And there, there is one, um, there is some, so one thing you have to think about when you do something like that and it's outside is when it rains, right? When it rains, things could like overflow and come on top of each other and it is too much for your plant. I did put a side drainage hole in the container so that overflow would happen. So when it rains, and the reservoir fills up, it will literally pour outside of the container, basically. And so there's there's a couple ways you can do it, but those are a few ways. That was that's what's up. That's what's up. What advice? Since we talking about new gardeners too, what advice would you give a new gardener um, like yourself? Because you was 
primary like, yeah. garden uh, you need to go? Get connected with a community garden of some sort. Get connected with people who are already growing in your area. If you can connect with people who are already learning, your rate of learning will like decrease by half. Like when I was interested in gardening, after I had come back to DC and I started picking up things with Afrobeats and things like that, I actually became a teacher. I was an educator for like a couple of years at the school called Minor Elementary, which is actually down the street from where I work now, which is the Washington Youth Garden. And basically I went there because I saw that they had a garden. That's what pulled me to, to teaching there. And so I was an educator and I used to um, you know, have kids that would only learn well outside. So like we would go over things like arrays and different things like that and they wouldn't get it. But then when I told them, okay, put these seeds in um, two by three rows so whatever, they could figure it out. But I, I was you know, hitting my head against the wall inside the classroom. But as soon as they touched the land and were able to you know, figure that out, then uh, they, they, they got it. Um, I forgot what the question was there. I'm like going off with it. Oh, what was your what advice <clears throat> would you give new gardeners? So you said yes. go to a community garden, mm-hmm. maybe go to a school and teach, um, and then you're yes. part of the Washington Youth Garden. Yeah. Talk about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, so How there's, there's different types of gardens you can go to. Uh, school gardens are a great way to get involved in your community garden. School gardens are actually the most desperate people to help. Because teachers are, speaking from being a teacher, former teacher myself, like teachers are so desperate for you to help in those areas because they have already a full plate, right? They're already teaching kids, but they want them to get outside. They want them to get involved. Um, so that, that was one of my first introductions to like the first community garden that I got involved with. Um, from there, I partnered with the youth garden because they have a program. If you're a teacher, the youth garden has a program called uh, a garden-based teaching um, for teachers who are just interested in getting in the garden and so i went through that summer it's called the summer institute for garden-based teaching uh that that's a youth garden program that we have and i got involved through that and i partnered with them and so my transition from the school to the youth garden was because i made connections and applied myself and said i want as much training as possible and took advantage of that basically the pto at our school was like hey we really want a garden we want a garden club you know uh, I saw opportunity as like, hey, I'm interested in doing this for you. Would you be willing to pay for some of my schooling? Or would you be able to pay for this class that I took? So I took a master gardening course at UDC um, while I was a teacher. And that allowed me to connect, make so many connections. Because when you do those kind of courses, <clears throat> I highly suggest doing certifications because when you do those courses, they require you to get a certain amount of volunteer hours. And so I had to go to places like the Washington Youth Garden or Keller Miller Farms or whatever gardens that were around the city that I could get my hours from. And so not only did that give me the skill set to learn how to grow food in different ways, it also connected me to the people who work at this big mm-hmm. garden. So if you tell me a garden in the city, I probably know someone who's connected to that garden just because I, when I was getting my hours, I was literally going to every single garden I could and learning as much as I could. I was like a sponge. And uh, I'm still learning to this day, even though I work at the garden, we have a farmer named Xavier um, at the, the youth garden and he's incredible. Like he tells me stuff all the time. Like the other year I learned how to cut sugar cane for the first time because we grow sugar cane in the garden. And, you know, he taught me how to use the machete and, and peel the skin and how to eat the, you know, the sugar cane and then spit it on the ground because it decomposes. And uh, it's, it's amazing. I'm, I'm really blessed to be where I am because it's like, you know, I get to be outside uh, you know, for work, which is which is great. I love the youth garden, Washington Youth Garden. Um, and it was crazy. So I finally met Christian this past August. You know, we were like talking online. We did a you know podcast, his podcast, but we never met in person. And I got a chance to speak at um the Washington Youth Garden um for the Summer Institute for um, Teachers. And, and educators who want to start gardens, and I actually met him and Xavier and all the good people. Big shout out to Ali and, and Brianna over there, who's who's been instrumental in helping me um, do some things. Um, yeah, so I'm I excited the, about that. Um, there's a lot of people, a lot yeah, of your friends in the room. Shout them out. Cousin, if you want she's to. principal over at um, Moten. She actually says there's a community garden that they are looking for volunteers for. So somebody in the comments. Want to link up with Cuz? 
Yeah. She's she's a yeah. You can yeah. DM me, you can DM him, you can follow him at Afrobeast, you can DM me, and then I can turn you on to those people, turn you on to him. What was your first garden gardening oh, success? First gardening success. The first time I was like proud. I mean, to me, the radish was a, a big success because it was like that in my mind was like I could grow food. You know, it just clicked with me is like, wait a minute, like the stuff that's in the grocery store. I can literally cultivate with my own hands. So that was mm -hmm. the first time. That's all I needed, technically. I would say the first time I had an official success was when I gave my mom. So I was living with my mom at the time. And it, she, ah, bless her heart, because she was just, <laughs> she was like, what is happening to this kid? Like this kid all of a sudden is buying all this soil. There's <laughs> pots everywhere, getting soil on the carpet because I was growing indoors <laughs> at the time. And the first time, I felt like a success was when I could share uh, cherries. I, I grew these Washington cherry tomatoes, these beautiful, bright red cherry tomatoes. And I gave one to my mom and she tasted it for the first time. She's like, whoa, like this is really good. Like I've never had a tomato this juicy, this sweet before. And that was like, I think that's when my heart gets touched with gardening the most when I'm allowed to share with people. I have another example of when, you know, we were in the pandemic and I, I'm blanking on the name right now, but we, I was growing uh, eggplants for the first time. They were actually the tiny eggplants. Another tip is like, if you want to grow in containers, find the like mini versions of some fruit and vegetables, you'll get a lot more yield. And so I was growing um, eggplants, the tiny eggplants. I think they were called, the variety was called like Little Prince from R Renee's Garden Seeds or something like that. Okay. Where is it, it the was white the purple ones, ones but they were just like tiny. The they were tiny. They were like container size eggplants. And so uh, I grew eggplants, but you know, I'm I'm still like new. I'm still trying to figure out stuff. Sometimes I grow stuff just to grow stuff, and I don't necessarily know how to cook it quite yet. And so uh, <laughs> I, I I tried to you know do some get do some things with eggplants, but I also had two separate plants that produce eggplants, and. I realized I only need one. I only had space for one. I could only grow in so much space. So I was, um, I was like, put it out to my story. I was like, hey, does anybody want this extra eggplant to grow on their own? And one of my followers hit me up. I was like, yeah, I would love to. I'll come by and pick up the eggplant. I gave them this eggplant money. And what they did with it was amazing. They had their own garden bed already. They were already following me. They already knew what was up. They took their eggplant, put it in their garden bed, um, and it thrived. They had so many eggplants that they got produced. And what actually ended up happening is they contacted me and was like, hey, we have too many eggplants. Would you like to take some eggplants from us? And I was like, yeah, sure. Like, I, I know what to do with them now because there was a lot of like cultural dishes that I was making with my partner at the time. And uh, so it was like, it was literally, you know, um, reaping the, the seed I had sown. I had sown that seed months ahead of time, not knowing that I'm not going to need two plants. With my generosity, I like shared that with my community and it immediately came back to me, like in real time. Like it was only a, like a month or two after they had planted that eggplant plant that I got the, to reap the harvest from that. So not only did I have the one that I had at home, but someone else was actually growing for me. And it just reminded me of like, the bartering systems that used to exist in our communities. Like back in the day, you know, I specifically think of the historic city of uh, Deanwood, which is like, I think Ward 8, like it's going to, kind of like the outskirts of DC. They, there was a big growers community over there. And back in the day, people lived off a of bartering system. So what that means is, you know, say we were in the same neighborhood, right? You specialize in sweet potatoes. I might specialize in collard greens. Instead of trying to grow both of those things, we might have a specialty item that we would grow at our home, and then we would trade with each other. You give me some sweet potatoes, I give you some collard greens, and then we exchange. Collard and that was, that was a system you know, we used to live by, and I really felt that in this, this one moment of exchange. I was like, wow, this is so powerful. Like, how do we keep doing this? Oh, yeah, I think we need to get back to that. Um, folks out there, if you want to swap this summer, this spring, let let us know because um, yeah. I grow a lot of things, too, and I'm happy to um, trade off or give away or stop growing. If you grow eggplant really well, mm -hmm. 
then I grow peppers well. I can stop growing eggplants and increase my um, pepper production, and then we can swap the peppers. Um, what do you make with your eggplant? Because I'm a mm. big eggplant mm. bacon fan. Uh, there's what do you make one with your eggplant? dish that me and my girlfriend made where it's actually like a uh, kind of like a fried eggplant fritter dish. And basically, you take the eggplant, you slice it into thin slips, and then you you actually the the batter of it is actually chickpea flour and what this does this has an amazing okay. taste to yep. it and I'll, I'll definitely if i find out what the actual dish is called I, i'm blinking right now but it you fry it in in chickpea flour and then it literally melts the eggplant inside because eggplant is a very soft has a very soft flesh so when you bite into this thing you get in this nice crunch but on the inside it's like soft and gooey and it's just like it's really good. So that was one of the things we made. Um, you can, do you put sauce on top of yeah, it? Yeah, like you, you like marinara yeah, sauce you, or anything. Yeah, on usually top of it? you know or there's different. some sort of like tomato based sauce that goes with it. I think we did like a sriracha mayo at the at the time too. That was pretty good. Um, but there's yeah, there's a lot of things good. you can do. Eggplant is a great meat substitute. I use eggplant in a lot of stews. If you get the right seasonings, then you can you can make that any kind of meat substitute you want pretty much oh yeah one time i made well i was um like you said you had mm -hmm. to learn how to cook the stuff and so when i first got into eggplant i made these eggplant um meatballs and I was like, yeah oh, <laughs> disgusting it's gonna be disgusting no it's gonna be disgusting eggplant meatballs those was the best meatballs i ever had in my life i mean and i don't know how i did i mm -hmm. used chickpea um chickpea flour to make it like Hard, yeah. you know, get it together or whatever, and form the ball. But those was in some incredible um, meatballs. Uh, what else um, have you grown? And then you cook that something. Yeah, um, I, I was a big fan of the, the, like beef patties. Are I use veggie patties actually? I did a lot of veggie patties because I had, like vegetables, so I just chop up the veggies. Um, I, I can't tell you how important spice blends are. I'm going to put people along right now. If you're in D.C., check out the Spice Suite um, in Tacoma Park. They have an amazing selection of specialty spices. There's a spice called um, jerk. This is like a, it's like a jerk spice. And I use that on anything as far as like Jamaican, uh, like Caribbean cooking. And so what I would do is I would like saute some vegetables, like cut them up. Um, and then add that spice to it and then create the, the crust for, you know, the patty and, and make that happen. And then the key to making it really good is to include a scotch bonnet pepper. That's something I've been like obsessed with, like growing scotch bonnet pepper is used in a lot of African and uh, Caribbean cuisine. It's a very yeah. hot pepper, similar to a habanero, but it doesn't taste anything like a habanero. To me, a habanero is just sometimes hot just to be hot, but this is like hot. And then it has like a fruitiness undertone to it. Um, it's a very like, it looks very similar to a habanero, but it's typically red. It comes in different colors. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful pepper. I have some in my freezer right now. Two things I keep in my freezer all the time is scotch bonnet peppers and okra slices. So when I grow okra in the summer, I cut them up, throw them in my freezer, put those in stews. You know, you can do jumbos, you can do all kinds of stuff with that. Um, and I'm continuing to learn. I'm continuing to learn. I've got a lot of cookbooks that I'm, I'm excited about. Um, I've also been uh, uh, experimenting with like Caribbean cuisine. Uh, there's this food called doubles, which is from uh, Trinidad and Tobago. It's basically um, this fly, fried flatbread that includes like chickpeas and veggies and a hot sauce. And it's like the best thing. Mm -hmm. It's like a, it's a crispy, pillowy fried bread. And then you basically put all the fixings on top and just heat that joint, and it's great, great. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm making myself it hungry. Sounds I good. Have that one sounds good. <laughs> yeah, I haven't either, and I have to go to um, work um, today. Um, yeah, big ups to the spice. Um, yeah. Spice sweet store, yeah. spice sweet. They have, I think they have two yeah. locations, right? I remember having seeing one like in DC by. Um, yeah, they're the expanding too. They just got point. into Nordstrom, I'm pretty sure. Black owned, black women owned uh business. Yeah. Shout out to Urban Veggie Queen for putting their link in the, the chat. 
um, but definitely go check them out. That's what's up. Um, how has garden gardening changed mm. your life since you started? It's changed my life significantly um, from multiple standpoints. Um, for one, I'm just more spiritually connected to like the land and people. I have a better understanding about the importance of life outside of work. Like, I think it's important to get outside and, you know, really enjoy the land and the fruits of the land that God gave us. And I don't know, I just feel myself becoming more spiritual. I, I feel myself becoming more monkey every day, every time I'm outside, every time I'm touching the dirt, every time I touch the land. I just feel powerful. I feel uh, connected to other people. I have more empathy, you know? I, I appreciate things more. I would also, yeah. I also That's like uh, cook a lot more than I did back in the day. I didn't really start cooking for real, for real until I started gardening. Uh, gardening was actually the, one of the key things that made me go vegan, that made me go plant-based because I was like, I don't need all these other things to be incorporated in my diet. Like I could live off of plants alone, really, and feel better. Like they felt the first time I tried to go vegan for a couple of weeks, it was actually off a dare. And uh, the reason the reason why it was even a dare <laughs> in the first place, because my friends who were in my uh, program were like, hey, like, I see you eat a lot of vegetables and stuff now. Like, you vegan? What's going on? What's going on? And uh I was basically like, no, but I, I could be vegan a couple weeks, no big deal. And they're like, no, you can't. Because for me, back in the day, like, I was like, I would eat everything. Like, I was a, a garbage disposal. Like, anything you put in front of me, like, that was, that was it. It was gone. Uh, but I found, like, like, food became my superpower in a way. Like, I had way more energy. Um, I started thinking more clearly. My creativity skyrocketed. And that's because I was eating food from Earth. Like, when you think about it, you know, what are some of the most important things you need to like live? You need, you need water, you need sunlight, right? Those are two most important things. That's all plants take in. So that's just yep. like living energy compared to like animals that are like, you know, you're, it's not living, you know, those are things that are dead, but plants are, are living energy. You're, you're getting the power from the sun. You're getting, you know, all that water. Most vegetables are pretty much made up of water, right? So yeah, just more hydrated, more thinking clearly, and more active. I think that's the part I'm, I'm interested in diving more with my platform is, like, how can you do more nature-based activities? Like, I'm getting into photography because I'm interested in, like, wildlife photography. Like, I want to, like, do more with, like, hiking and camping and things like that. Those are things I've just never even crossed my mind um, back in the day. But because I'm more connected to land, because I'm growing my own food, those are options for me now. And I, I, I definitely agree with you when I was putting this together, this show together, because last year I had the mm -hmm. Black Gardener virtual talk tour, which was just me going down around to different platforms speaking about gardening. And then when I wanted to say I want to help some other people and put them out there because now I have a platform. And um, I started thinking about the ways that I like the land now and being out in nature and I want to do those same things like hiking and canoeing and stuff that I would never do right. I would people <laughs> to cut the grass you know what I'm saying um, and now like no you can't cut my grass I, I, I have to do it you know what I'm saying I want to be outside you know what I'm saying I'm, I'm walking barefoot outside but in my little opening I always talking about how we are reconnecting to the land um through um, gardening and farming. And I think that is an awesome thing. One of the people that's on today is the Urban Veggie Queen. And she said this coming garden season, she wants to take at least one mm -hmm. or two days off of work just to go gardening and be in the um, yard. Absolutely. And I think that is a powerful thing. Yeah, absolutely. You know yeah, and I'm, I'm hoping we could talk a little bit about the state of our food system. And, and yeah, cause- Oh yeah, we could, cause, yeah. Yeah, it's go into it, it. It's concerning. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna <laughs> okay. list, so this, it's just right been on my mind. I want to jump into it because it's so important to realize the state that we're in, not just as a community, uh -huh. but real quick, real quick, real quick. Folks, share this out to people so they can get this information. This information is, is vital to our people and even some people that don't look like us, okay? 
you know, share it out to people, and then we're going to start talking about the food system. Yeah. Like that. It's crazy out here. Um, so, like, I know happened. you did a talk recently about the food system not too long ago, and so you might know just as much as I know about it, but, like, to my understanding, the food system is in disarray right now. Like, it's, it's, a, it's a huge issue. You know, prices of foods are going up. You don't have to go far to your local grocery stores to see that things are not on the shelves like they used to be, or they're getting a lot more expensive. And the reason for that, there's a couple of reasons. One, there's supply chain issues. Supply chains are breaking down because of the effects of COVID and everything that's happened. You have the, the great resignation. People aren't working as much. So that mean, also means in food. So people, so basically people who don't know the great resignation is people uh, leaving their jobs in mass, right? COVID has revealed a lot of things about our jobs as well. We realized, oh, why am I spending all this time working this hard and my company doesn't even value me or I'm not being compensated enough for what I do. And so people are leaving their jobs in, in mass, right? And that also includes our food system. So the, the labor that it takes to get our food to our plate, there's a cost to that, right? It's not only a cost like financially, but there's a human cost. And there's a lot of issues with how our food is given to us in an ethical sense, right? There's, there's like, uh, and this is extreme, but there's, you know, things that are going on that resembles like modern day slavery in our food system because there's a lot of people who aren't being treated correctly, you know, when they get the food to our plate. Um, that's one thing. Uh, another thing is the food that is getting to our plate that actually makes it to us after these supply chain issues isn't like the most nutritionally sound food, right? Or there's something wrong. Like how many how many stories of like E. Oh, coli yeah. have you heard from like romaine lettuce and just all, all kinds of stuff? Just this week, they had an outbreak yep. and two people so, like, died. It, it's Let's concerning, but and I, I want people. To, I advocate for you to at least start the process of figuring out how to grow your own food. If you don't grow your own food, at least connect yourself to someone who does, or get on someone's property who does. Whether that's your community garden, whether that's a local neighbor. If you have someone next door to you, tell them, teach them, you know, tell them how to how to grow food, or ask them how they grow their food. Uh, because what's going to happen is this isn't going to get any better. You know, we can't really trust our, our government in the world to, like, fix it for us. We have to, like, go back to being in smaller communities where we support each other. And so, like I said, going back to that bartering system, figuring out, you know, who is growing what, what's going to happen? Go through the scenario in your head. If this grocery store shuts down, where am I going to get my next meal? from? Like, just think about that. And if that question scares you, then you should be growing your own food. <laughs> yeah. Because for me, to like, food. <laughs> and I fully acknowledge, not everybody has space. I live in an apartment. Like, I'm in, like, an apartment area right now. But I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to be showing my whole process from start to finish. Right after I get this call up, off, like, I'm going to be in planning mode. I'm about to go on and create a schematic for my garden. Because right now, the space that I have is, like, a Juliet balcony. So I have a little balcony. It's, like, west-facing. So it's good enough to, like, grow a little something, right? I'm going to see... How can I maximize the space to yeah. grow food? So maybe that for me is starting with some garden boxes on the railing. Maybe that's growing peas up the kind of trellis that is like the fencing of my balcony, right? There's, there's certain ways you can grow and get creative with how you grow where you don't need a lot of space. You know, to me, I always say, if you have the heart to grow, then you can grow, basically. Oh yeah, I agree. I agree. I totally agree. My um, little brother has a garden on his balcony, and he grows about wow. forty percent of his own food. And he has everything. He has a peach tree on there. He has a fig tree. He has a some other kind. I think it's a pear tree or something. All on his balcony. Um, the only thing he can't do anymore yeah. is grow viney stuff because <laughs> the vine stuff grew up to the neighbors. Um, um, yeah. balcony and they complained and I was like why are they complaining all yeah. they had to do is just grab a couple <laughs> squash and, and cook it up but they complained and the, um, the people in the complex was like you can't grow any more viney stuff yeah. but you can continue to have your garden so um, I think y'all need to go and check out um, Afrobeat's um, yeah. Instagram and, and TikTok because that apartment setup that he had this past um, summer is incredible. Yeah. I was like, how is he going to do this? I mean, and then you saw him like <laughs> leaning outside hey, the window, grabbing robot. stuff, 
It Everybody was incredible. Means. He had a um, what is that trellis? I had a trellis. Yeah, the trellis and everything. That? Cause that was that was a fun project. So yeah, talk about. Because uh, you just said you're gonna build a schematics for your apartment now in this apartment yeah, balcony. Absolutely. So I'm last year that, that was like my biggest undertaking yet. I had a garden bed outside of my window. Basically, I had this little um, ledge. And it was just big enough for like a, I think it was like a two by five garden bed. And it's about, I use this method called uh, square foot gardening, which is basically a method used to maximize your garden bed space. And so basically imagine a garden bed, but each part is sectioned off into like 10 different squares. In those different, 10 different squares, I would grow different things. So I grew uh, Kalu, which is like a great, um, green for us like culturally it's very significant uh, i think i grew uh some peas i grew uh strawberries you know i grew so many different things i had like eggplant tomatoes um and there's these uh tomatoes called uh plate de haiti and they're i call them like haitian tomatoes um they're they're kind of like apple looking tomatoes but they're very delicious very good great for like sauces and uh, stews and things like that but basically the concept was i built this garden bed mm -hmm. and i sectioned it off into 10 parts thinking about the size of the plant thinking about companion growing what grows well together i was able to create a situation where i had like 10 plus plants all in this one garden box and a lot of people think like oh you know, those things, you know, kind of overcrowd each other. Those things will, you know, not work together, but they work perfectly fine, especially if you like keep them pruned, section them off and make it work. Um, I also attached a trellis to the end of one. So when I had climbers, for instance, like tomatoes, or if I had, um, so I, you can actually grow zucchini actually on trellises and everything, um, which is really interesting. I learned a lot from Xavier at the youth garden because he grows everything vertically because sometimes depending on what you're growing like for instance tomatoes it's better if you grow from like one stem or like one stock rather than a bunch of other stocks because uh, it puts the concentration on the fruit and not the the leaves themselves so i i grew so much i only had a little bit of ledge i just had a little bit of ledge and then in my backyard i had a fully concrete backyard except for one patch of dirt that was open and i literally filled that <laughs> with like flowers and herbs and just different things like that. And so if you see some of the places I've been, you're like, there's no way food can grow there. And I would figure out how to do it regardless because I was just that motivated and uh, that ready to do it. That's what's up. Uh, folks, if you have questions, put them in the yes. little question I... box. Don't put it in the chat because we want to, you know, if you have comments, you can do the comments in the chat. But if you have questions, put it in the little question box in the side and if you want to know how to follow the people go to the top this is black garden talk the garden um talk there's a little um arrow that's shooting down or and you can hit that and you can find out all, all the people that's on this live right now and then you can actually follow them i want to talk to uh you know, a question stuff. somebody asked me where i get those exotic seeds from um there's a there's mm -hmm. a seed distributor called true love seeds so if you can put that in a track true love seeds True Love Seeds is an amazing organization because they partner specifically with black farmers and farmers of color, and they specifically sell heirloom seeds. So the, the reason heirloom seeds are important for those who don't know, heirloom seeds are basically um, God-made seeds, as I like to call them. So seeds that naturally come from the land. So that means when you plant this seed, you'll get a very similar plant when you save the seeds at the end of the season versus like hybrid seeds or GMO seeds. Those are like genetically altered seeds to get the best result for kind of like uh, agriculture and commercial like distribution. So God, God made versus like hybrid seeds. Heirloom seeds are super important. They specialize all in heirloom seeds. They're called true love seeds. They have a African diaspora collection when you go on their site, they have an African diaspora collection and you can find everything. That's where I got my Kalu. They got the Scotch bonnet pepper on there. They got the fish pepper. Definitely look up that history. That's very interesting. But 
they really focus on indigenous cultural seeds and heirloom seeds. If you're going to buy seeds for the first time, go start with heirloom seeds. There's some fun hybrid seeds. I'm not going to lie. There's some fun colors and things like that you can do. But the importance of heirloom seeds, and I'm really big on heirloom seeds because I believe in legacy. I think two things we can do to continue pushing our legacy as a people in this space is to make sure we are collecting seeds. That's going to be super important. And then also recipes. If you can do those two things, keep a box. I wish I had my seed box. I literally have a box. I have a box of seeds. And it's an old box that was made like in the 60s. It's a nice wooden box. I think I'm going to make another one or figure out how to make a kit or something. But I literally organize the seeds. I put the dates on the back of the seeds. I put them in the category. Is this a, you know, uh, leafy green? Is this a fruiting vegetable? Is it a seeded or potted vegetable? And I literally categorize it. And what's going to happen is I'm going to keep collecting these seeds year after year after year to a point where it's like, I'm going to pass it on to the next generation. So something I'm growing now is going to be passed on way after I'm gone is the point. Because I'm going to teach my kids that's, that's, and that's their true. kids how to grow food. And so you leave a legacy when you do that. And that's kind of what happened to me. I didn't even know it, but my grandparents left a legacy in me that I didn't even think about. When I used to go home to uh, North Carolina for Thanksgiving and Christmas, and we had these big family functions, <laughs> we were eating sweet potatoes and, and, and collard greens, right? I didn't even know at the time, but they were teaching me how to be self-sustainable because I remember very clearly when I was younger, we used to go to, they had a little garden. They had like a couple plots of land. They had so much land, but they were only growing on a couple little plots here. And they would grow specifically sweet potatoes and collard greens because they kind of had to because it was the most efficient way because we had a big family. Like on my dad's side, we had like, oh, I don't know, yes. seven, he had like seven, eight brothers and sisters. They all had kids. They have kids. So it was just like this big yellow house in this yard. And they had a couple plots of land. And they would literally go out there and show us how they pick up the, the sweet potatoes and the collard greens. And I realized that's actually my first experience with growing food that was the first time i was like oh food comes from the ground like that's something i always knew like food comes from the land because i saw it when i was mm -hmm. that young that's probably decades away from when i actually started growing food myself but that little moment there like that's set up for me doing this purpose work that i'm doing now for the rest of my life that's what's up one of my first questions always off the off the, off the break is always mm -hmm. what are your first memories of gardening and you just told us that i chose not to do that this time yeah. because we kind of started a little late um but um yeah that's what i kind of stopped because i know some people like myself we would go down the south and we would see things my great grandma um was a hundred and something years old and um she had a garden she had a whole farm in the backyard i was scared of her because she was so <laughs> old i tell people that put that story that she was so old i was scared of her so when we went down i was just playing a garden but then when i saw my mom and dad about to leave i jetted back to that car because i was not staying <laughs> my siblings would stay but i was not staying um but that's a great story um that your grandparents had that garden and my my father's family had 17 kids and so they um, always grew food but it was funny when they came to maryland when they came to live in maryland they kind of like we're gonna get a real job we're not gonna do this gardening stuff or this farming stuff so they didn't really teach us um that when we moved to maryland it was only when we got in a bind we threw some seeds out in the yard and then we had some collard greens or we had kale or we had sweet potatoes and um, that's what my mom did. But I was going to ask you where true you get your seeds from. We know true Probably. love seeds. Um, how do you decide <sighs> what you're going to grow? So I think of the big picture of like what I'm trying to do as an educator. So you have to find out your why. Like, are you growing for yield? Are you growing for education purposes? Are you growing uh, because you just like a certain crowd? Like, there's specific people who are, um, you know, they only grow herbs or they only grow flowers because that's what they're, they're passionate about. That's what they're called to do. Uh, for me, I'm trying to be an educator. So I want to grow as much as I can in as small a space I can because I want to prove to people that no matter where you can go, you can have a garden. So for me, I'm trying to grow diaspora crops because I think the biggest way to connect to the land is to understand yourself first 
And in order to do that, we have to understand our history and where we come from and the things we eat, you know. Next week, I'm actually doing something with the youth garden where we're talking about the difference between sweet potatoes and the yam. And we're going to share that with kids and have them do a taste test. A lot of people think that yam and sweet potatoes are the same thing. They're not the same thing. Like yam is very much has this rough exterior. It kind of looks like an elephant's foot in a way. And it has like a very like white flesh. Oh, yeah. It's a little, you use it more savory than sweet. And then the sweet potato, you know, is, is sweeter. You know what a sweet potato looks like. People call it candy yams when they add sugar to it and put it in a pot and cook it up. But it's not technically yam. And so that's a that's a part of the education I want to do. I have a really a three tiered system of my platform and how I want to connect people and land. First, I'm like, all right, let's start you with growing your own food because if you understand how to grow your own food, we can do a lot with that and we can build community around that. After building your own food, let's learn how to cook your own food. Like, how do you eat things nutritionally? How do you really do you go from garden to table and take what you took from the land and you planted? and sustain yourself and think about it creatively because we're not, people aren't creative in the kitchen like they used to be. We have so many services, right? We got DoorDash, we got HelloFresh, we got everything where food is coming to us, but what about your intuition? What about the things that are passed on through your family? You know, you need to be recording your own family history and a good way to do that is through food. Start with like the recipes you know and then build from there and create a catalog so that you guys have a legacy that you can pass on to the next generation. So after cooking, then we move to the third tier is like nature-based activities. How do you get connected to the land? In other ways, maybe that's outside of growing food. Maybe you need you you want to try hiking. Maybe you're a biker. Maybe, you know, you're someone who is into wildlife. Like there's different ways you can connect with the earth. And once you do that, it just leads to like a powerful life. Because if you can figure out how to grow your own food and eat right, that's like half the battle for many things especially when it comes out. That's what's up. Um, a couple more questions. What What is the hardest plant you've ever tried uh, to grow? Hardest plant I've ever tried to grow. Hardest plant I've ever tried to grow. Um, I, I, str I struggled with watermelon last year. I struggled with watermelon last year. You need a lot of space for watermelon. Um, you need a lot of patience. I think I started too late a little bit. Um, sweet, sweet potatoes also can be kind of tricky because that's one you don't start from seed. You have to start from the slip, basically a plant that comes out of the sweet potato. Mm -hmm. um, so those two, I'm still learning to try to like master. I want to get watermelon down because I love watermelon in the summer. Um, if you could get, anytime I get a seed of watermelon, I always save the seeds because I'm like, oh man, they're so hard to get. They're so hard to get. It is for a reason. Like if they're hard to transport, yeah. like you need space for it. Those are definitely hard. Uh, I'm one thing I'm excited to try. Um, shout out to my uh, girl Cola B from the Black in the Garden podcast. She sent me some Brussels sprouts, and Brussels sprouts is something I'm very interested in trying to grow because I love Brussels sprouts, but I know it's not easy. Also pineapple, mm -hmm. but that's also because pineapple could probably never grow here. <laughs> it's really hard. It, can they? Yes, they can. I have twelve. I have two what? Oh, you got the grow light situation. Right yeah, now. okay. I like that. two of them. Are, <laughs> yeah, two of them are fruiting right now, but um, I have grown over five wow. pineapples so far. Sure. Um, they're not as big because I guess it's the weather, but here, but they're um, oh, okay. they're about medium size. But it's the sweetest thing I ever had. But every time I get a pineapple, I take the top off and I um, root it. We're to the point now where it's about 12 or 13 pineapples in my basement under grow lights until it gets warm. And then I will put them out back outside. Yeah. But two of them are fruiting right now. Um, there's a couple questions. One person said, who who did you say grew zucchini vertically? Go, come, and, come and visit me at the, Washington, the National Arboretum, Washington Youth Garden. I'll hook you up with my guy, Xavier. He knows all about vertical gardening and getting the yield out of fruiting vegetables. Um, so what he does is basically he has a garden bed and then he has like this kind of trellis around it. He ties a string to the top of the trellis, kind of imagine like a frame. He creates a frame around the garden bed. He ties one string from the bottom of the garden bed to the top of the garden bed. And then he grows the zucchini up instead of out. And what that does is if you keep it on one stock, it'll concentrate all the energy of the plant into the fruit. 
and you'll get more yield rather than you know having to deal with all the vegetation that comes with growing something like that. That's what's up. I grew lufa for the first time, first time this year, and I actually grew it vertically yeah. because I didn't have no more space um, in the ground because um, I had watermelons growing, um, and I got like mm -hmm. a, a orange watermelon and a white flesh watermelon, um, which was really crazy. But another question was, do you know the difference between the black seeds and the white seeds? Um, is there quality? in black seeds or white seeds or water. I honestly don't I, either. I don't know that answer. Um, it's very interesting because I don't really see when I when I get a really seeded uh like a really like organic heirloom watermelon, I don't see a lot of white seeds. I'm wondering if that's more like the hybrid seeds. I know the black seeds for sure, those are the ones that I try to regrow and get a plant from. Um I would have to do more if you know work on that, but that's a good question. Now, it's funny when we we talk about seedless stuff. So when I had had a seedless watermelon, yeah. there were like white seeds in it, like not a lot of them, but it was a few white seeds in those seedless uh, watermelons. So um, yeah, that's something that me and Christian has to research and learn about the difference between the white Absolutely. and the black watermelon seeds. Um, um, but we as black folks, we ran the watermelon um retail back in the day that's how we made our money um, Great when we were enslaved Just, and yeah and, uh, and got our freedom we we used that yeah. but then they demonized us and to the point where they joked about yeah. fried yeah, chicken the whole, it's economical the like that's not just like that can come out of nowhere we were making a lot of money from selling watermelon and they basically like you said they demonized it they made it seem like we were inferior and it caused you know a lot of problems and now like people are afraid to like reclaim that history but i encourage you to like look into the history of watermelon and how that uh, we used to profit off of that that used to be an industry for us yeah um do you have a favorite trick or tip you picked up along uh, the way favorite trick or tip um definitely the self water containers man i love the uh I, I'm going to put out something um, in the next month or so where it's going to be a challenge to get people growing. And um, one of the things I'm going to introduce in that challenge is how to build a self-watering container. You can start really simple with this. You can uh, take those garden boxes, you know, two-foot garden boxes that you can pretty much get anywhere, your Home Depot, your Lowe's, whatever. Um, and then take uh, takeout container, Chinese takeout containers. Make sure they're, you know, a nice little size that can fit inside those containers. And then what I do is I empty it out, clean it out, obviously, put the cap on the container and then make some holes in it. When I make some holes in it, I put the hydroponic tube inside of that container, sit that inside the, um, the, the, the pot, the container, the garden, and then I just add soil, add my soil, and then put my plants on top of it, and the little hydroponic tube will be sticking out of the soil. You water that, fill it up. You can kind of see how much it takes to, to fill that up, and you have your own self-watering container. So that's my little trick. And, and when you're doing the, the, that trick, are you, um, are you um, what is it, pumping, pumping the water in, or are you just putting the water in? Let just like just the way you water you know, house plants once a week, I do the same thing with the self-watering container. So, so it's bottom, not even bottle watering, water. it's like a reservoir, because what's happening is the water is staying inside the container. It's not keeping everything wet at the bottom. It's staying inside the container, okay. and then the roots of the plants are soaking up that water like a straw. So they only take what they need, and there's air pockets down there because you have the container kind of like making its own little like air bubble. Um, but that's worked amazing for me. I use that for leafy greens a lot. It's perfect for leafy greens because uh, leafy greens, you have to water a lot, right? So like if you're making, if you have a salad greens mix, instead of watering it every day, like I use this system and I water it once a week and then they take up the water once or twice a week, depending on the plant, but they take up the water themselves. I don't have to regulate. I don't have to stick my finger in the soil to figure out if you know it needs to be water or not i mean you can still do that if you notice it's dry it's like oh i need to fill up the reservoir but like for the most part one time every week i fill up the reservoir i know that 
the reservoir fits about half of my container that I'm filling it up with. So I just put that much in, let it go for the week, and then come back next week and do this to, to start to grow. I definitely have a video on that, but I'm going to be doing more content on self-watering containers because that is something people don't talk about is because a lot of people feel like they don't have enough time to garden, but there's different tricks and methods and systems you can put in place to make it more efficient. Oh, yeah, the, you can buy those other yeah. things, too. You can fill them up with water and push it into the thing. So I have a dragon fruit, um, dragon fruit plant here at the house, and so I take one of those things and put it it's like a steak. And you put water in there, I stake it like that. Um, that's what's up. Uh, we would love to see some Hydroponic more content systems. and video around love that. Um, so, yeah, so people can um, see that. But I have like only like two more questions. No um, we passed the hour, but because <laughs> we started a little late, I'm going to let you stay on for a minute because the information is great. Um, but do you have a favorite plant or vegetable in your garden? when you were growing what is your favorite, favorite? I'm, I'm i mean i'm pretty basic i'm a sucker for tomatoes it's just something about tomatoes like towards the end of summer that's just really great you can just take it off the stock um i also love i'm really feeling kalu these days because kalu is easy um once you get it going it's it's done you know you you're, it's going to take over actually <laughs> if you're not careful oh yeah i have I, I mean, mm -hmm. I started selling calla seeds now because yeah. they they just everywhere in my yard. Um, the when the wind blows, they like yeah. in the summertime those seeds go everywhere. Um, but so I got up to the point now. Yeah, where I, kind of sell I like um, I, I think okra. Yeah. Okra is one of my all-time favorites. People don't understand okra. Okra is like. Is, is a gem, not only because when I think of the African diaspora and I think of one crop that could represent the African diaspora, I think of okra because okra is there's a history to it. You know, the fact that it's one of those things that actually made the um, journey over from slavery to the Americas is huge. Like our ancestors put seeds in their hair and braid it in their hair because they knew yeah. the importance of agriculture and having that history with us. And so the fact that that made that trip over with us and is still, you know, such a huge part of the culture and people use it in very different ways. You know, some people throw it in stew, some people fry it, you know, some people eat it raw, believe it or not. People, people think it's kind of like some people oh, yeah. think it's gross or slimy, um, but they don't ask themselves, why is it slimy or what do you do with that? And a lot of people don't know that it's a great uh, thickener in stews and soups. That sliminess actually breaks down in the soup very nicely. You get this very velvety, smooth, rich taste when you include okra in a dish, like if you're making a gumbo or something like that. Like it's it's incredible. And there's so many different sizes and colors. Like there's a mammoth size okra that you can do. That I do the red okra at home. And it's really cool with kids, especially because when you're going through the process of saving your okra seeds, you basically have to wait until they turn into like these little maracas and like the seeds are rattling in. You can kind of shake oh, it. Yeah, and kids market. love that, shake man. It. Like kids love that. Yeah. And the, that, like, as you were saying, they, um, folks mm -hmm. to, um, put it in the hair, they put it in the hair after it dried out too. Um, I, um, going to grow some pink okra so yeah. there's a lot of different colors out there great um, snack. which is great i love okra too yeah they're not as slimy as most people think they are um but one of my favorite things that i've done with them was pickle them wow and that was really great um and of course i love fried okra um we have a little um new fast food um restaurant here that has mm -hmm. was based out of memphis so they have fried green tomatoes and they have fried okra and they're really, really um, great over there. Um, and then my last and final question is, what are your future plans uh, for gardening? Future plans for gardening, it's a good question. So for me, this year is all about community. Um, so I just launched a Patreon now where people can join and there's gonna be an exclusive Discord group as well as um, some exclusive content that I'm doing over on Patreon and recipes as well. And so what I want to do with that is get back to the system I was talking about, where we have a bartering system where people can connect with each other. And on a daily basis, we're constantly sharing our tips and tricks with each other. It's like through the Afrobeats podcast, I'm interviewing some of the best people in the world at what they do. 
So everyone from people uh, composting to, you know, cryptocurrency and the, the vegan space or like people getting into investing. Um, I'm also really interested in careers um, within food and agriculture space. I think that's not something that's talked about a lot. In order for us to have this sustaining connection to the land, this has to be a viable option for business and for to people make a living on. Like if this is something, this is all you think about and this is what you do all the time, you should be finding a way to capitalize on that because uh, it's important. It's important for our youth to understand like you don't have to be a lawyer, doctor, um, or going, you know, these different, you know, platforms that were made for us. There's so many opportunities. I know so many people in this space that do all kinds of things. I know people who sell flowers. I know people who will do teas. Um, and they all have a love for agriculture and growing their own food, but that is expressed in different ways. You know, I'm working at the Washington Youth Garden right now while also doing the Afro Beats thing on the side. And I absolutely love it. You know, I'm working with, you know, youth right now. We have this program called the Green Ambassadors Program where we bring uh, young people in and teach them about the land and give them the skill sets they need to uh, go into whatever career they want to go into, but especially if they're in food and agriculture, we want to bridge those connections with people. And so, you know, we're connecting with podcasters and, and all kinds of things and uh, really building those relationships. So that's what's really important to me right now, community. That's what's up. I believe it's community for me. Um, next week, I'll start a four week um, workshop uh, yeah. working with people in Uganda. Um, it's going to be remote. And then right after that, I'm speaking at a black farmer symposium. And so my talk will be how to go from backyard gardening to a full farm. So this summer, I'm going to break ground um, it, on a farm, it. hopefully, in Saluda, Virginia, with three acres of land. Um, and then just continue to be a garden coach to people, getting people to grow their own food um, and using my platform to get that out. And so I'm really excited that we're both thinking about community and how we can make money yeah. and how jobs can come about in this field of work. You know what I'm saying? This is my passion. So now let me turn my passion into um, money. Not saying that money is everything, but I do want to, um, you know, monetize it now. Um, because I think in another year or so, I'll probably quit my Absolutely. job and do this full time. I need a way to do that. But um, I'm really excited to have you here today. Um, it's been a pleasure. Um, we got to connect more. Maybe yeah. I'll come over to the Washington Youth Garden uh, um, I, I need, soon. I need to see these but uh, next week, y'all. You got you to gotta invite me over for lunch or something. Oh, yeah. yeah I got to see what's going on. It's, it's funny. Um, this young lady, this this older lady I met on Facebook, she actually got me a pineapple yeah. from um, Hawaii. Um, you know, I don't know how she got it from Hawaii to Maryland, but I uh, got a Hawaii um, um, pineapple plant, and that's the one that's fruiting now because um, I put a, um, a a really great new um, mm -hmm. grow light on it that mimics the sun really well. Um, the other grow lights are like the purple, the red and blue lights that gives that funky purple look. But the one that's on the one that's from Hawaii has that. It mimics the sun. And grow lights like is a whole other conversation. We um, might have to come so, back for that because that's oh, what yeah. people. Yeah, yeah. we got to come back and talk about that. We got to do. So what I plan to do with my platform this time around this year um, is mm -hmm. do some Sunday night lives where I'm talking to just different things about um gardening and and politics and and you have a whole mixture of like um like a sunday night live where I do, it's just about anything and it just happens sometimes to talk about um gardening as well um that's what i'm trying to do but next week y'all i have back-to-back -back episodes of black gardener talk so sunday is going to be um this guy named andre the farmer he's going to be on at 11 a.m. He's out of, I believe he's in Florida. And then we have um, Gardner, Garden Under Influence. That's my girl. She's going to be here. And um, she's an incredible um, young lady. Yesterday, she had a live talking about um, GMO seeds and hybrid seeds and heirloom seeds, which was really, really interesting. Um, two of the guests was on there, or they didn't really know the difference between a lot of them. So that was an interesting conversation. So me and her will get into that. Um, just so you know, folks, you cannot buy GMOs, 
proceeds. They're not for um for consumers like us to buy. They are only for like commercial use, like with different farmers and different things like that. So if you get your seeds from the dollar store, they're not GMOs. If you get them from Walmart, they're not GMOs. Now I have had people talk about they have that Roundup on it. I don't know too much about that, um, but I don't believe it. I think that person was just trying can to we, sell me Can we do seeds. one more question? Uh -huh. like, mm -hmm. And shout out to everybody yeah, who is in the chat. Uh, yeah, shout out to everybody. Soulfully. Yeah, go ahead and ask your question. I can hang for a little bit. Yes, go ahead. We got Any time. Melanated Woman 45. Did you send it in the comment? No. Oh, she said, I'm interested in growing food, but she don't know where to start. Well, That's follow really, both yeah. of us and we can Definitely help. Follow me because I'm going to do yeah, a challenge gotta, where I'm going to make it very easy for you to get started and give you everything from start to finish to just get something in your window. And uh, whatever your situation, we'll figure it out. So just stay tuned and we got you. Yes, yeah, stay tuned. Hit him up because um, Christian has classes. I don't have any classes right okay, now, sure. but. Maybe um, later on this year, I might have some classes, but I'll definitely be doing content around how to start the seeds and um, putting them in a greenhouse. I'm building a greenhouse this year, uh, like a full-fledged greenhouse in my backyard. I have April said, kids, but I'm going to build one. Uh, question two. Let me see what her question was. She struggled with continuous supplies of vegetables uh, growing. Share them. Um, share them with anybody you can. Are you... Yeah. She she's saying she has too much stock. Basically, she has too many. To... No, she oh, doesn't. She do... she oh, doesn't oh. Get enough. so it's a yield issue. Uh, like maybe. Oh, uh, um, I would yeah. check the soil. Oh, she has she has she has a lot. Oh, okay, of okay. So I mean. I'll we'll answer both of those. So if you, the problem is you have too much, share with your neighbors. Like start off with that. Just bring them over as like, hey, I made this, or create like a big feast or something with your neighbors. Start that community within your own space, and that will create conversation. Like, if you can get people a taste of food that you're making, they're gonna know well, how'd you do this? This tastes nothing like the grocery store, and that starts a conversation. You're planting a seed for someone else to start a garden is huge, you know. And like you said, like if you have space, but you're like, oh man, I really wish I could do this and this. I don't have enough space. Getting someone else to grow is the best way to do that because you can be like, hey, why don't we work together? You grow this, I grow that, let's swap. That's, so that's the issue with, like I was telling you with my eggplant story, I, as soon as I put that seed in to share and give, it immediately like came back to me. Sometimes it's not immediate, sometimes it's later down the line, but that eventually does come back to you. Um, and then if you're not having enough, like if you aren't growing enough, you're not getting enough yield, Make sure you pay attention to your soil. A lot of people focus on the plant. The soil is the life force of the the garden. If you get if you don't get the soil right, then the rest is not going to fall into place. So make sure you you know your soil science. Yeah, know your soil. One of the things I had to learn was, and maybe April, you did this: um, opening a pack of seeds and putting the whole entire seeds in the ground, and. Um, <laughs> I did with cucumbers and it was, one year I had like almost mm -hmm. 500 um, cucumbers and I had no clue what to do but give them away to my neighbors and then I was like if you if I give these away to, to you you have to grow some food so my goal this year is definitely to go in my neighborhood yeah. and knock on doors and give them seeds but don't put the whole entire pack of <laughs> seeds in the ground because you would probably get a whole bunch of um, vegetables and then you can't do anything but you can also mm -hmm. can them y'all also think about we were talking about food shortages and food insecurities and different things like start canning your your vegetables you know if it's carrots you can put carrots in water you can um you can put them in a solution too or brine and do it you can put some um you said habaneros in there you can put ghost peppers in there i love ghost peppers so start thinking about canning and preserving those vegetables uh, if you're getting a lot of vegetables as well and then when you yes. learn it Absolutely. Each one, yeah, I, uh, guys. If you have more questions, I'm gonna have yeah. to hop off. But please shoot me a DM and yeah. then come on, you can give me this uh, video later on, and we can figure it out there too. Yeah, it'll be on YouTube awesome. in about 20 minutes, and um, as well. Um, so yeah, I can um, I can shoot you this too when I um, clip it down. Um, 
But yeah, thank you so much, Absolutely. Christian, for coming through. Tune in next week. Um, we have two amazing people, one on Saturday morning at 11 a.m., and then we have one on Sunday um, at 11 a.m. I'm trying to expand the program where I want to reach um, about 40-some black and brown gardeners this year, female and male. So um, keep checking. Um, yep. Put on your live notifications um, and all that good stuff. So, Christian, Appreciate thank you, you so much. I'm going to let you get out of here. But before we go, I always say live your life healthy, free from negativity, That's and always up. stay dumb, y'all. All right. Peace, y'all. All right. Peace.